Good morning. Today on Spotlight, the case against Detroit's controversial proposal P. If passed, the charter revision would make major changes to the city's governmental framework. Sheila Cockrell, a former Detroit City Council member, community activist, and now CEO of Citizen Detroit, will join us along with Reverend Horace Sheffield III, pastor of New Destiny Christian Fellowship and the CEO of the Detroit Association of Black Organizations. A couple of weeks ago, we talked to those in favor of Proposal P. And later on our Sunday morning program, Marianne Udall Phillips will help us take a close look at the proposed changes to Michigan's behavioral health care system. The founding director of the Center for Health Research Transformation has spent her entire career in health care. It's Sunday, July the 18th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Former Councilwoman, I'm going to start with you. You recently spoke at a Detroit Regional Chamber event and you said the charter will create, the charter revision will create challenges, chaos, and confusion. Break that down for me. Why do you make that statement? I think there'll be challenge, the, the, the challenges will come in part from the complexity of the, uh, the changes that, that are being proposed in terms of the operation of city government. I think there'll be chaos because it's not going to be clear who's really got what responsibilities where. And I think confusion is really going to be a critical issue in terms of the roles of the mayor, the council, and the newly and some newly appointed boards, elected boards that are going to have powers that used to be exercised more specifically by the mayor and the council. So for quick quick example, Detroit has historically been a strong mayor form of government. Uh, been, and it's been an issue that people in Detroit have been very strong on. There is another form of government that a lot of communities have, which is a council manager. And there are a few, few small, small communities that have a weak mayor form of government. Reviewing the nature of the changes that have been made and reporting and, and responsibility, this, is, this new charter revision attempts to be some combination of all three. Those that are for this charter revision say this is for the grassroots. I'll start with you, Horace Sheffield. Are you sort of turning coat on those that you have been fighting for years and years and years by opposing Proposal P? Well, absolutely not. And I'd have to get my little saying it's an illusion, delusion, and a ball of confusion. Look, I'm in favor of a strong mayor form of government. I was around and my dad and Buddy Battle and, and Hubert Holly and so many other folks fought uh, the Mariani administration to stop police brutality, and we're told basically where to go. So we have a situation where she just described from uh, from rants that some of them engage in in terms of the mayor and people support him. It's very clear that this is designed and directed to take power away from the executive branch of government, which you know, is unstable. I mean, we elect a mayor. I want to be able to hope you know, one person or maybe nine accountable, but not 49. Sure. Okay, we're having a little trouble with your signal, but but I think we've, we've certainly heard enough to be able to get the gist of it. Uh, Sheila, I'm going to go back to you. Um, sure. You have said that there could be problems with pensions, perhaps yeah. even the bankruptcy agreement that could send us back into receivership. How so? Or is that just scaring everyone? No, I mean, um, the, the for example, I, part of what it is, that I, one of the things I learned a long time ago with government and public policy is what you always have to look for is unintended consequences of well-intentioned ideas. For example, here, one of the in, embedded in the um, in the charter revision is the potential for the, uh, the 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 mayor and council to revisit the rela the relationship between the Great Great Lakes Water Authority and the DWSD department. That alone, if that were to happen, because that's all tied to the to the plan of adjustment, which is the governing document that we're operating under post bankruptcy, would literally create the the potential that that that, that 
that relationship would have to be revisited by the bankruptcy court. That, uh, that I can tell you, pensioners, people like myself who have a city pension, who made the major sacrifices to get us out of bankruptcy, people are really scared that any kind of financial instability is going to result in there having to be you know, some further change made and people who are already, in, re already dealing with the consequences of changes in benefits and changes in pension could face even more so. Reverend Sheffield, uh, the, the, the people in favor of this charter revision, when they were on the program, they said that you did a commercial that's been running all across the airwaves with very prominent uh, Detroit citizens in it. And they said you did the commercial and you hadn't even read the charter revision. Is that true? Yeah. Well, at least, at least I can read. Uh, many of them I don't think can read or spell if you look at some of the signs that they put out. Look, I mean, their whole argument is not directed to the merits of the charter that they propose, but attacking people. I mean, and, and I, I refuse to go there. Uh, you mentioned grassroots, or have I turned on what I've been? No, I've always been for what I think is in the best interests of Detroiters. And, and, and this era of rebirth and revitalization, we've maintained uh, clear and defined roles of responsibility. So no, I have read this. I've continued to study this. Uh, I know that there are a whole lot of provisions that put a whole lot of folks in. And let me just also correct one thing. They keep saying we say that it's free. Well, when you look at all the people who don't have to pay, it's virtually free. We can find a different name. How about almost free? When I talk to senior citizens and people who own properties, they're very concerned that all of these things they want to basically provide based on income to people is going to result in them having to pay more taxes. We will take a quick break. We'll come right back and we'll talk about some of the legal ramifications and how this may or may not affect those of you who have to go in and vote on this proposal. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Sheila Cockrell, this has become just a legal quagmire. You've had some courts that have tried to keep this off the ballot. Now you've had arguments before the Michigan Supreme Court from both sides. As we do this interview, the Michigan Supreme Court has not made a ruling on this, but it could come at any second. People have already started voting, those that are voting absentee. Um, what does this say about the messiness of this process and what kind of signal we're sending to the voters. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Chuck. It's a really big issue. I mean, that this is part of the chaos I referred to earlier. I mean, it's like, it is pretty, you know, it's, it's mind boggling to think that people are voting on something that some court could at some point find is illegal or, at, you know, at some point it could say that it is legal. Um, and it not be clear beforehand. It doesn't help build trust and confidence in government when you have this kind of, of back and forth. To me, there's two sets of issues in terms of the legal arena. There's the, there's the process questions of was the procedure followed that's legally required to get a charter revision on a ballot? That's the one set of things. And I believe that that's sort of the, and I am not a lawyer, but one of the fundamental issues that's being engaged in by all the various sides is whether or not the governor has the legal responsibility to uh, to approve it before it goes on the ballot and was the timeline to do that met. So that's one thing. There are, however, equally important legal issues that have been raised by the attorney general, which is part of the reason why the governor made the decision to not certify it. The governor has said there are provisions in this charter that are unenforceable and illegal on their face. Two quick examples. One, we all know many years ago, the cities in the, in the state lost the right to impose a residency requirement, except that the state law did at 20 miles, you know, in, in around the jurisdiction. The charter reinstates a, a city of Detroit uh, requirement in order to be employed by Detroit. You, that can't be done legally. The, the charter provision, the charter revision also says that people can take 14 years to protest a tax assessment. State law says it can be one year. Those, so we have, we're, we're promising things or raising people's expectations in the city for things that may actually be ideas that uh, many of us could support, but you can't do it in the city charter. And if I don't like what they do, I vote them out and find some people who will represent that agenda. Uh, but to put some of this stuff in, you know, she's right, illegal 14 years to pay property taxes. I mean, things like that uh, and all the different additional boards 
that make it quite clear that nobody's in charge, that no one has the authority to do anything, it would just be a, a, a layers of confusion and, and would breed additional contempt by folks who already don't respect people uh, for the positions that they take. Sure. Sheila Cockrell, one of the accusations um, that's made in regards to all of this is says that the current charter gives too much power, too much favoritism to the big development people, um, the, the big corporations, the folks who have all the money um, and have influence with city government, and that the little people, the small business owners, the small developers um, do not have that same kind of access, and that's why there needs to be some revision in this charter. You agree or disagree? No, I do, don't agree with that. One, the, the charter as it is set up, the kinds of things that are there, there are items that have been put in the charter that are currently matters of ordinance that in my view should stay in in the ordinance and not in the charter for example the community benefits mm -hmm. ordinance process that's been is being moved from an ordinance into the charter one of the key things we need to be very clear on is any charter revision that is approved the only way to tweak it to even make a minor change in it requires yet another vote of the people you can't run a a government that has to have all major decisions be a revote on by, by the by the residents. There's an election procedure in here that is highly detailed, highly prescriptive. That would require any change would require that it have come back to the, to a vote of the people. It is it is not it's not a nimble document. It's not a a framework that permits your elected officials to 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 play the roles they're supposed to play. This is representative government. It is not direct democracy. I mean, this is a, a document about running basic services for people to make that to, to add the level of complexity is going to make it even harder to get delivery of service to everybody include developers included large and small. Sure. Reverend Sheffield, uh, time's always my worst enemy. I have about 30 seconds left, but I'll give you the last okay. word on this. Is there anything about this charter that you really like? Yeah, I, I like the spirit of trying to find ways to make life easier for those who are burdened financially. Uh, I think that some of the, the building trades or skilled trades have a good idea in terms of making certain that uh, they're included. Um, but at the same time, it cuts both ways. I mean, this $250 million bond we just had primarily went to uh, smaller businesses. We got to find some way to come together in the middle uh, so that union interests and, and, and uh, entrepreneurial interests are both met. But yeah, there are things in here that I like. I like us helping as many people as possible, but not at the expense of financial bankruptcy. And very quickly, and if for some reason this proposal P passes, uh, what is, will you as a community leader do to reach out to the other side to say, okay, we've got to come together some way, somehow? Yeah, I've, al I've already done that. I mean, I, I reached out to everybody except those who talked about my mother, my dead mother, and, uh, you know, said some insidious things. I mean, some of those folks, you know, I mean, that'd be like, like, like uh, me dining with Jezebel. Uh, I just don't see that happening. But, you know, the, the Cole and the other people out there who I love and respect, uh, and I've had many conversations with, and we're sane and civil with each other. Um, so that's where we need to go. And by the way, I think that they really do do their cause and injustice, the way they behave and how they talk, talk about folks. I mean, this is not about me or Sheila Cockrell. This is about what we think is in the best interest of Detroit. All right, Reverend Horace Sheffield III, Sheila Cockrell. Thank you so much for joining us today on Spotlight. Uh, they are opposed to Proposal P. And when we no come, one beat. Oh, all right. And when we come back, we'll turn our attention to mental health. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Let's start off talking about behavioral health in this state. Uh, some people call it behavioral health, mental health. Uh, last time I checked, we're talking about a roughly $3 billion industry that state government has a lot of control and say so over as well as part of the federal government. But now there's great debate in Lansing about trying to reform it, change it, whatever term you're most comfortable with. As you look at this debate, where are we right now? And what are you pleased with from what you see and what concerns you from what you see? 
Yeah, so we've been talking in Michigan for over five years about changing the public mental health system, right? And so we have two competing proposals in Lansing right now, one that's being discussed on the Senate side and one that's being discussed on the House side. And they're different and they would affect, both of them would affect the public mental health system in a critical way. As you say, $3 billion goes into the mental public mental health system, but many more people in Michigan have mental health issues than are those served by the public system, right? So it's a, it's a really big issue and a big topic. And I think we should talk broadly about really what the state's needs are. At the same time that we've got these bills in the legislature, the department, the executive branch, is in the middle of implementing a very exciting opportunity that's been funded by the federal government to expand the integration of mental health and primary care called the Certified Community Behavioral home, Health Home Project. What the governor's team is working on is a really exciting and yes, a very good program to help expand access to mental health services by using our community mental health agencies to work more closely with primary care. And that's real integration of care. That's a federal program that was funded. It was originally funded in eight states and Senator Stabenow got additional funding with colleagues, it was a bipartisan proposal. She got additional funding to include Michigan as part of the CARES Act. What do you see as the potential roadblocks that have to be overcome to be able to come to some kind of resolution to all of this that, as you said, we've been talking about for the last five years or so. What, what are the biggest roadblocks here in a very partisan atmosphere? Right, well, of course, you know, the real, let's talk a little bit about what the people of Michigan need, right? What is our okay. real with mental health? And our real issue is that we have a tremendous shortage of practitioners, of hospital beds to take care of all of those who need the care, right? More than 20% of Michigan's population has been diagnosed with a mental health issue. And we have uh, more than two thirds of those who have been diagnosed with depression saying they have difficulty getting access to care. We have people sitting in emergency rooms waiting for 36 hours or longer to get a bed for care. And so the critical issue we should be dealing with as a state and that the federal funding for this new program does help us with is the shortage and the, the access to care. We have 33 counties in Michigan with no psychiatrists, no psychiatrists. 33. 33 out of 83 counties with no psychiatrists at all. So how we support mental health practitioners so that we have more funding going into the system is really crucial. The bills that are being discussed in the House and the Senate don't focus on those issues. They focus on something entirely different. And I don't think they really focus on what most Michigan citizens really need to address the problems that we're facing. Is the same for psychologists as well? We have shortages of therapists at all level. We have more social workers and we have more peer counselors than we have uh, psychiatrists and psychologists. But yes, PhD trained psychologists uh, and psychiatrists, we have a shortage everywhere. And we have a tremendous shortage of beds for those who are most severely ill. Uh, and very quickly before we go to the, the break here, how do you solve that issue? Because that's an education issue. That's getting young people trying to decide at an early age when they hit college, I want to go on that track and I want to get a degree in that particular area. We do need more funding in the system. Psychiatrists, psychologists, psychiatrists get paid so much less than cardiac surgeons, right? So it's Part of it is what we have valued historically, this goes back to the roots of mental health and how we viewed mental health in our country, the stigma associated with mental health, right? We have never funded the mental health system the way we fund many other things on surgery and on the physical health side. So some of it is funding, uh, some of it is education, you're absolutely right, but I actually think there are some, also some innovative solutions. There's more telehealth options now, more support that can be provided to primary care. A lot of people are getting their services now through primary care physicians instead of through psychiatrists. And those primary care physicians need help and support. And there are new 
uh, approaches that are being taken to, to help them with those services. All right, uh, I'm getting myself in a little time trouble here. We're going to rush to a break. We'll come right back and have some more questions for Marianne Udall Phillips. We'll be right back. One of the things being talked about is a registry. Uh, I think they're calling it, yeah, they're ca calling it a registry. What is that and how does that play into all of this? Yeah, so one of the good things the legislature did was pass a bed registry so that when somebody shows up in the emergency department and needs admission to hospitals, they get those hospitals, those emergency departments can see where there are vacancies. And so that's the idea behind that is to create more of a statewide system so that hospitals can transfer patients as quickly as possible into the beds that they need. That was a great bill that the legislature passed uh, that was by, supported on a bipartisan basis. And that supports our public mental health system and others who you know, really have challenges in finding care for people. Uh, they're telling me I got about one minute left, but I've got two quick questions for you. Uh, has COVID-19, this pandemic, has it been, for lack of better words, almost that perfect storm in terms of exposing any warts that were there in our healthcare system? Oh, absolutely. First of all, the needs, the mental health needs. So before COVID, 20% of our population said they'd been diagnosed with a mental health issue. That's only gone up. The needs are much greater now. Needs among children, social isolation, uh, the fears from the anxiety created by COVID-19, the demand and the need for mental health is enormous, and that is only growing right now. Sure. Um, and your reflection back, they, all, they say that hindsight is always 2020. Uh, you were in the thick of the Affordable Care Act debate. Uh, you yeah. were running the State Health and Human Services Department under Governor Granholm during that time. Looking back on it, uh, has that been a plus or a minus for America? Oh, there's no question it's a plus. So many more people have access to health care. I think there were some unanticipated effects on the behavioral health side. We needed to shore up funding in additional areas. Uh, but overall, there's no question it's a plus. All right. Marianne Udall Phillips, thank you so much for joining us, weighing in on this uh, very complicated topic, but very important topic. And we appreciate all your involvement throughout the years. And I know that you're still in the thick of it. And we appreciate you sharing it with our Spotlight audience. Oh, delighted to do it. And I'm so glad you're covering this very important topic for so many. Glad to do so. Stay safe. You too. And I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more Newsmakers in the Spotlight. Don't forget that if you aren't registered for the August Michigan primary, you have until tomorrow, Monday, to do so. Have a great week.